Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. My name is Marlies Ustermann, and together with my co-chair, Professor Tabour from Paris, I'd like to welcome you to this session, which focuses on fluid removal and fluid resuscitation. We've got four giants in critical care with a lot of experience, especially in the, man in the field of fluid therapy. And it, I, I'm sure it will be an exciting and stimulating session. We're going to uh, have questions at the end of each talk. So I'd like to invite you to come to the podium after each talk and talk to the individual speakers. And we start with Professor Shapiro from Boston talking about fluid, talking about, <laughs> one second. That's the concept of liberal versus restrictive fluid resuscitation still makes sense. Great. Thank you very Ooh, Are we on here? Thank you very much, and thanks to the Congress for inviting us to present our data. And I apologize that I'm double booked right after this, so I have to scoot out to miss a little bit of the rest of the session. Um, so in addressing this topic, uh, I'm going to actually just drill down on a recent trial that we did. Um, that may, some of you may have seen, looking at restrictive versus liberal fluid management. And I'm going to talk about how we address this particular question. I'd like to acknowledge the members of our writing committee, as well as the PEDAL Network, which is an NIH-sponsored network who conducted the trial. So I have to be honest, I've been coming here and talking about fluid balance for close to the last 10 years, if not 15 years, and there's been arguments about do we go liberal, do we do restrictive, who's right, who's wrong. There's been a swinging pendulum and where before Rivers it was restrictive, after the Rivers trial was published we kind of take, took a liberal approach and everyone said, wait a minute, you're probably going too far and let's back up and we're hurting people. But a lot of this has been, really been done honestly in a lack of high quality evidence. So let's think about what we're talking about. In the restrictive approach, the idea is we're giving less fluids, we're re reducing the overall fluid balance, we're using early vasopressors to treat the problem of vasodilation, so a pharmaceutical targeted at a, me at, at, at a mechanism. We're going to prevent worsening pathologic edema, and there's a lot of observational trials out there that so show an association between fluids and positive fluid balance and better outcomes. On the liberal side, you're, you're naturally augmenting cardiac output to improve perfusion. You're going to decrease the exposure to vasopressors, which could have detrimental effects. There's some good preclinical data that show you're increasing microcirculatory flow, and, and there's a lot of fluid-centric fluid approaches out there. So really, in this balance, there's arguments on both sides. There's been a, a number of trials recently that have started to address it, the classic and, and uh, one and two trials, especially classic true two, which addresses the question in the ICU setting. And we felt like there wasn't enough evidence out there for the early emergency department setting or early setting. So we set out to answer this um, study question with a hypothesis that are restricted, which we really tried to characterize as vasopressor centric or vasopressors followed by rescue fluid approach um, versus a liberal uh, approach, which is really fluids followed by rescue vasopressors or fluid-centric approach, would reduce 90-day mortality and sepsis-induced hypotension. That's the trial that we, under, that we set out to conduct. The, the design is a phase three trial. It's non-blinded, 24-hour um, protocol. So for 24 hours, you were put on one protocol or the other, which guided your um, fluid and vasopressor titration strategies. Um, the primary outcome was mortality prior to discharge home by day 90. We plan to have 2,320 patients in the trial, um, and we hypothesized a 15% mortality in the liberal group, and we'd compare that to 10.5%. That's how we powered the trial. Um, planned DSMB analysis at one ter third, two third, and end of the trial. So the study was conducted by NHLBI Network. 12 um, hubs, but what's important is 60 hospitals, Mass General Hospital is the coordinating center. So this was conducted across 60 hospitals. Inclusion criteria, age greater than or equal to 18, this is adults, suspected or confirmed infection. And we relaxed the definition for hypotension a little bit to blood pressure less than 100 or MAP less than 65 after a one liter challenge. 
We deliberately relax this a little bit because we felt that patients in that 90 to 100 range, a lot of times we'll address those patients by giving them fluid boluses. And a lot of times those semi-hypotensive patients will become hypotensive. So we felt that this was important in including in the target population to ask the question, should we be bolusing these kinds of patients? So blood pressure less than 100. For exclusions, we wanted to get to them early. So if it was greater than four hours from meeting criteria, they were not eligible greater than 24 hours from coming into the hospital. If they had already received more than three liters of fluids, we felt like that was headed towards a liberal approach so we couldn't randomize them. If it's non-sepsis causes, if there's severe volume depletion. And so we've had questions and we had a lot of debate about this, which is on one hand you say, listen, we should just put everyone in the trial to make this as broad as possible. But on the other hand, we said, listen, this doesn't make sense. If there's severe volume depletion, we're not gonna then fluid restrict them. So we really tried to get patients who were on the gray zone. If similarly, if they had fluid overload, they weren't eligible for the trial because you wouldn't do a liberal approach for those patients. So we wanted to try and define patients who were in that gray zone in the middle and say, what should I reach for first? Should I reach for fluids or should I reach for vasopressors? Uh, we have a host of secondary outcomes that we'll get into in the results section. And so what I'd like to do is describe the protocol a little bit because in some ways we really um, try to, to strike the balance between an efficacy and an effectiveness trial and with a little bit of pragmatism mixed in there. So we try to have the patients still do personalized resuscitation at the bedside, but we, we try to influence whether they, again, use fluids as the central part of their resuscitation or vasopressors as the central part of the resuscitation. So for the restrictive protocol, the first thing we did was halt any maintenance fluids that were happening. Um, and then if they were hypotensive, we would hang vasopressors. Uh, of note, we did not really intend to address that initial 30 cc per kg for surviving sepsis. That really wasn't the study question. So patients in the restrictive group were allowed up to two liters of fluids initially at the discretion of the physicians. Some patients would have 500 cc's before coming in the trial and stay there. Others would get a little bit more fluid. Um, we also allowed rescue fluid criteria. And so um, if you were, if you met these guidelines for rescue fluid, you had severe hypotension. If you were already on 20 mics per minute of norepi, you were allowed to then start using fluids. If your lactate was four and rising, you were persistently tachycardic greater than 130. And we also allowed a clinical gestalt or clinical override, which is if the clinicians felt like this was in the best interest of the patient, they could override the pro protocol and give some fluids. Similarly, in the liberal group, um, we, try, we struck, tried to strike the same balance. The one important thing is the first thing we did was if patients were randomized to liberal, we had a, a two liter infusion with a safety check at one liter. And so the first thing that happened was patients would get up to two liters of fluids, they get a liter, we'd assess them and see if they were still tachycardic hypotensive um, and or the clinician felt like they'd benefit from additional fluids and then the second liter could go in. And similarly, um, there's rescue vasopressors. But I'd also like to highlight something. As far as the indications for giving fluid, we wanted patient, uh, doctors uh, paying attention to their patients at the bedside, and we had a very broad inclusion for why you could give additional fluid. So any measured assessment where the clinician said they think they should have more fluids, they could give fluids. Any, um, I'm sorry, measured or clinical assessment where the physicians for whatever they were using, heart rate, CVP monitor, whatever it is, if they felt like the patient needed additional fluids, they could give the additional fluids. And then finally, we had the rescue vasopressor criteria. Similarly, these are, are indications for where the patient could cross over within the protocol. So with all that, the trial was stopped at the planned second interim analysis after 1,563 patients were enrolled. It was a four-year period, which um, was that, that last part of the trial was in the middle of COVID. Um, if we go through the criteria for um, what happened, it was 1,200 patients were screened, 7,000 excluded, which is a lot. And a lot the main reasons for exclusion were unable to get, were mostly around getting informed consent. And ultimately, we randomized 1563 with 782 to restrictive and 781 to liberal. When we looked at the characteristics of the baseline, they were very similar and what you would expect um, for a US-based trial. Sorry. Um, 
And they were well balanced, about 71% uh, white, 14.5% Hispanic or Latino. When we look at coexisting conditions, 28% uh, about 28% diabetics, 11.5% heart failure, 4.7% end stage renal disease, and I'd like to point out that the median time from meeting criteria to in randomization was 61 minutes, so the patients were really addressed quickly, and about 92% of the patients were enrolled from the emergency department. Other patients were those who were seen in their early ICU course. Finally, the, it was about two liters of fluids that patients got before being randomized. So the first question is, did we conduct a clinical trial? And this table, I believe, addresses that as I whiz through it. So there was about 1,800 cc difference. So on the median amount of fluids in the restrictive group in the first six hours was 500 cc's compared to 2300 in the liberal group for 1800 cc difference that persisted out to 2100 cc's over 24 hours 22 percent difference in vasopressor administration uh, 1.4 hours earlier for the restrictive group for vasopressor um, initiation and four hours longer so if we look at this i'm just going to present those same data in a similar way two liters before 2,300 to 500 cc's in zero to six hours, 3,400 to 1,260, zero to 24 hours, pre-randomization of 24 hours, 5.4 liters to 3.3 liters. So as far as fluids, it's fair to say that one group got two liters more, the liberal group got two liters more than the restrictive, and vasopressors were given more often, earlier, and longer. So we'd submit to you that yes, we in fact performed a clinical trial. When we look at the primary outcome, there's just simply no difference in our primary outcome. It was 14.0% mortality in the restrictive group compared to 14.9% in the liberal group for a difference that's not statistically significant of 0.9%. And if we look at it over time, essentially those curves are very, very close to each other. So there was no difference in mortality, and, I'd, and it was also interesting to us that we were spot on um, with our mortality estimate prior to the trial. So we felt like we had achieved the, the kinds of patients that we were looking to achieve. When you look at secondary outcomes, there's just simply no difference. 20-day, 20 28-day organ support-free days are the same. 28-day ventilator-free days are the same. Hospital-free days are the same. When we look at second, other secondary outcomes, no difference in renal outcomes, ARDS onset, new intubation is the same. 1.7% uh, difference, not statistically significant. Um, and serious adverse events was very similar. So secondary outcomes are the same. A couple other interesting um, aspects of the trial, pre-specified subgroup analysis was similar across the board. There was no group that was different. Um, CHF, where one might hypothesize restrictive would be better, there was no difference. This one's interesting, and I'm not going to cross the line to talk about trends, but this is interesting that end-stage renal disease um, does favor restrictive. Finally, just looking at other interesting metrics, 8% more patients went to the ICU in the restrictive group um, related to the U.S. practice that uh, likely related to the U.S. practice that patients on vasopressors go to the ICU. We don't tend to do these on the wards, and so that probably drove an 8% difference. Um, central venous line placement was 7% higher in the restrictive group. Another, um, this was a, stu uh, I don't want to call it a hypothesis. This was something that we deliberately set out to observe in the trial. We felt that it was important in order to get the vasopressors on early to um, use a allow the use of peripheral vasopressors. So this was a protocol um, specified allowed action in that patients were consented to say at some of our hospitals use this as a use peripheral vasopressors routinely, others did not. We had it as part of the consent in the protocol that we're going to be using peripheral vasopressors. Um, 500 patients, about 500 patients or 503 patients in total um, had peripheral vasopressors and 500 i'm sorry 500 patients had vasopressors in total there was three complications which were all self-limited complications of extravasation so essentially no meaningful complications amongst the 500 patients so this was not a pre-specified hypothesis or testable hypothesis per se but we think that's important data in support of the safety of peripheral vasopressors So 
Um, just a little bit of discussion. We have to agree that, as in any trial, the results apply to the types of patients enrolled in this trial. Patients in severe fluid overload and severely volume deplete were not enrolled in this trial. Um, the protocols, we did our best to add some element of personalized care where you're paying attention to the patients and acting to them. So it wasn't a protocol that was blind to the patient. We did, hemodynamic monitoring was allowed, but was really not um, very pervasive in the trial. So you were allowed to use whatever you wanted, any kind of non-invasive hemodynamic, but it wasn't protocol specified and it wasn't part of the protocol and its use was very low in the trial. So there could be a future direction there. Um, our design choice, we specifically decided to include one group where we could define as this group headed towards a vasopressor-centric and this other group headed towards a fluid-centric approach. We, we considered but made the choice not to include a wild type or doctors do what they want arm in the trial, though that would have also been a, a reasonable approach. Um, there's subgroups of patients that might benefit from one approach, approach or the other. We looked at clinically defined subgroups in the trial, as you saw um, in our subgroup analysis, but there could be other endotypes, biomarker identified, you know, machine learning identified subgroups where, who may benefit from one approach or the other. And the really question, the big question too, is where do we go from here? We have an ongoing trial um, by the ANSIX group that's gonna add some more data. There's also a trial starting up in England that's gonna add some more data, but where do we go from here? And, and for me, it's a personal question is, are we gonna get the mortality here by tweaking the amount of fluids or the amount of vasopressors? What was interesting in rolling patients in the trial is I was liberal typically in my approach. In the trial, I had patients randomized to restrictive. I found out both methods raised the blood pressure for the most part, and it turns out the outcomes were the same for the patient. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Shapiro, for leading the trial and presenting it to us in a very elegant way. It's open for discussion. Are there any questions from the audience? I can't see any question. Could I just ask you then, is it, does it still make sense to talk about liberal and restrictive fluid management or should we just abandon these terms? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think the, still the question is you're at the bedside, your patient's hypotensive. Do I reach for fluids? Do I reach for vasopressors? Which one's going to be better off for the patient? At the, I think what our trial, the data suggests is you can reach in either direction, make your patient normotensive, and the outcomes should be roughly the same. And until we come up with newer approaches or newer subgroups, either choice is going to be a good choice. I have a question here from my co-chair, Professor yeah. Taboul. Uh, I'm not sure that it works. Is it work? Yes, it's working. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, if I want to understand your study, if I want to understand, I, re uh, I read your paper, of course. Uh, you gave fluid first in all patients. Uh, no, patients received fluid first, two liters, which is not negligible. It's not negligible, mm -hmm. knowing that the total plasma volume is between 2.5 and 3 liters for, for normal people. Yeah. I think that two liters before randomization is not negligible. Therefore, for me, it is vasopressors after fluids versus vasopressors after fluids. So, or could I re rephrase that as fluids after fluids versus yeah, fluids, at, right. vasopressors yeah, after fluids. Yeah, you're right. it, it is a very good point. You know, in the United States, we tend to give fluids and we have the government involved. It's a big mess. But absolutely, there could be a hypothesis, there could be a criticism of the trial that says that first two liters, that's what killed people, right? And then once you got rid of that, then you did a trial and it was the same. And so could there be a study out there that doesn't, the average amount of fluids beforehand is less sure and i you know i'd love to see that trial um invite anyone to do it it's hard in the united states because we have to consent the patients um but it's a valid point the question is is were we restrictive enough um all we can say is that from the two therapies administered with two liters difference there was no difference. The other thing I'd say is it's a median of two liters. So there was definitely, just like there were patients above, yeah. there was definitely a bunch of patients below. Question here from Professor Debaka. Uh, Nathan, uh, as you uh, 
mandated, let's say, two liters just after randomization in the liberal group. And it stays exactly the same for up to the end. Um, what finally was the difference in the protocol? Because indeed, you just randomize, you receive two liters, and then you have a specified algorithm that allows also crossovers or whatever. And finally, your patients were exactly the same f just after the two liters in the two groups. Yeah, no, it's a great point. There was, there was probably, to be fair, about 350 cc's difference, right? So, so some patients got more and some patients got none. So there were some patients who they got their two liters, they were fine, everyone left alone. And we're okay with that. There was other patients who got two liters and got more. There was other patients who were on vasopressors and then eight or 10 hours later, they got some fluid boluses for whatever reason or their norepi went to 20 mics. So, you know, it's where the personalization came in. One might say that that initial two liter infusion over the first several hours is what really split the difference between the groups. It's a fair, it's a, it's a fair observation. And the final question from Professor Bakker. Thank you. Um, great presentation, Nathan. Um, I think there's another possibility. <clears throat> if you add to Jean-Louis' uh, comment, uh, Andromeda 1 limits the pre-randomization fluids to only one liter, I think there's another problem as well, and that's your endpoint. So basically what you show, if you use fluids for mean arterial pressure or norepinephrine for mean arterial pressure, doesn't make a difference. Maybe the endpoint is not the right endpoint. Like mean arterial pressure. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And we're, we had, this was a great committee who designed this trial. We had 20 emergency physicians, intensivists, surgical critical care. We debated all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, we said, we want to do a trial that's going to be most generalizable. That's where we got rid of hemodynamic monitoring. That's where we got rid of as many mandates as we could. It's where we add a lot of discretion at the bedside. So at the end of the day, we tried to simplify the question as much as we could to, do I reach for fluids? Do I reach for vasopressors? Is one gonna to lead to a better outcome? We can't, we, from our study, one might generalize within the confines of two liters first, either seemed okay. And so that's our study question. There's a lot of nuances, there's a lot more questions to learn out there, but at the basic, at the core of it, if someone, if I'm a liberal person and they're yelling to me, you're giving too much fluids, I can say, I can give fluids. As a liberal person, I also learned I could hang some peripheral vasopressors, make the blood pressure better. And my real question is what's best for the patient? Our data suggests that both are okay for the patient. Thank you, Professor Shapiro. Thank I'm you. afraid we have to move on. I'm sure we could discuss forever. It's given yeah. us a lot of food for thought. But so, we need to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have the presentation of uh, Professor. So good afternoon, of everybody. Professor Sheila Mayatra from uh, Mumbai, India, uh, talking about limitations of the free responsiveness test. Good afternoon, everybody. And shifting gears a bit from talking about restrictive and liberal fluids, I'm going to talk about assessing fluid responsiveness and what are the limitations of the current tests that we have. I have no disclosures for this uh, presentation. Now, uh, just to put things in, in uh, perspective and just to give you a context, and this is an old paper that I like very much published in CHESS, which shows that 50% of the patients to whom we give fluids in the intensive care unit are actually not fluid responsive. So does it really make a difference? Does it really matter? We know that excess fluid loading is, uh, you know, results in excess morbidity and mortality in the patients. And at the same time, if you don't give uh, adequate fluid to the patients, there may be uh, a problem. So, you know, not during initial resuscitation, but subsequently following your initial resuscitation, determining which patients are going to be fluid responsive is really a challenge in the intensive care unit. And I'm sure you all agree because on one side, you don't want to push the patient to pulmonary edema. And at the same time, you don't want to, uh, you know, you want to restore organ perfusion and correct hypotension. Uh, so when you ask the question, should I give more fluid, what you really want to know is will the cardiac output increase? Because if the cardiac output is not going to increase, you're not going to produce any benefit by giving fluid and you might actually produce some harm in certain patients as we are all aware of. So when you ask the question that should I give more fluid to this patient, of course we're talking about, you know, you should ask yourself these questions. Is there the presence of acute circulatory failure? Now you and I may also be fluid responsive, but that doesn't mean that we need fluid. Is the patient in acute circulatory failure? The second question I would ask is, is the patient fluid responsive? Because there's no benefit of giving fluids if not. And the third more important question is that even if the patient is fluid responsive, that's only one part of the question. The second part is that there should be no major risk in giving 
giving fluid. So even if the patient is fluid responsive, I might consider not giving fluid to this patient. Now I'm going to talk about the various tests that we use to determine fluid responsiveness. And uh, I'm going to talk about the limitations of some of these uh, tests. So what we mean by fluid responsiveness is essentially a state in which administrations of fluid will improve, lead to uh, improvement in the stroke volume and hence the cardiac output. And we usually refer to about 10% increase in the cardiac output to be a fluid responder. And uh, you know the, the ways by which we can determine it and the gold standard is of course uh, giving a fluid challenge. So you can actually give fluid and look at the increase in cardiac output. And this is a, a, a more recent uh, iteration of the fluid challenge from uh, Jean-Louis Vincent and uh, Professor Daniel De Becker, when you give a certain volume, at least 4 ml per kg of fluid over 10 minutes, so you don't give it away excess time, and then you look at the response to the cardiac output. And of course, if the filling pressures increase, then you may not uh, consider giving more fluid. You can also use the mini fluid challenge that has been now described several years ago, where you give a, a smaller volume of fluid, but this requires a very good echocardiographer, very uh, you know someone who can uh, more precise uh, you know who is an expert so because it's a very small volume of fluid that you're giving. Now, a lot of people talk about this as a method of predicting, but I would say when you repeat the mini fluid challenge several times, you are still giving uh, some volume to the patient. Now, giving fluid to the patient and assessing fluid responsiveness is one method, but the issue with this is if the patient is a non-responder, you can't take that fluid out. So what we really need is tests to assess fluid, predict fluid responsiveness. That means before giving fluid, you should be able to determine fluid uh, responsiveness. And if you look at the surviving sepsis campaign and also the ASICM guidelines for fluid administration in circulatory dysfunction and I was very fortunate to be a part of this committee that looked into form regulated these guidelines both they suggest that you use dynamic over static parameters like CVP to assess fluid responsiveness in these patients so what are these tests to predict fluid responsive that witness that we're talking about now most of them are based on heart-lung interactions. Now, this is important to understand. Uh, like you're talking about the respiratory variations in the stroke volume or their surrogates like pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, IVC variability, SVC variability in the diameter, and non-invasive tests like the plethysmographic waveform. A new test that we've developed in our unit called the tidal volume challenge, end expiratory occlusion test, and also other tests like lung recruitment maneuvers. Now, all of them depend on heart-lung interactions in principles, and so they have all the limitations of the tests using heart-lung interactions and there's one test that does not depend on heart-lung interactions, and this is the passive leg raising test. So I'll just talk a bit about the commonly used test, not all of them. And I'm sure those of you who put an arterial line in the operating room and the ICU have seen these typical dynamic changes in the arterial waveform. And this is normal physiology that occurs with inspiration and expiration, but you will see big swings in patients in who, who are fluid responders. And this is the principle that is used when pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation is calculated automatically by the monitors. Uh, you take the maximum minus the minimum and divide it by the mean and you get a value on the monitor. Uh, for pulse pressure, pressure variation, you don't need continuous cardiac output monitoring. All you need is an arterial line, which you will usually have in a patient with acute circulatory failure. For stroke volume variation, of course, you need a cardiac output uh, monitor, and you, these, you get these kind of cutoff values above and below which the patient is a fluid responder. Now, if you look at these tests, there are three meta-analyses that have shown that pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation are quite reliable, and uh, you know these have uh, this is one of the, these are the, one of the most extensively used tests in clinical practice, especially. Uh, in the operating room. But these tests are not without limitations. They have many false positives and false negative values. You're using arterial waveform analysis, so obviously they don't work when you have arrhythmias, uh, when you have um, you know, uh, increase in abdominal pressure, spontaneous breathing, and open thorax. One of the most common limitations that you have is the use of low tidal volume. And I'm sure you all appreciate that today we use low tidal volume not only in patients with ALI and ARDS, but also patients who are, have sepsis. In fact, even in the operating operating room today, we're using about 6 ml per kg tidal volume. So you have, a te you have these tests that work really well at 8 ml per kg, but when you use, have a tidal volume less than 8 ml per kg, these tests are not reliable. And in our unit, we developed a new test, and this is called the Tidal Volume Challenge, because as, you, as I, I mentioned, these tests are very reliable at 8 ml per kg, but don't work very well at 6 ml per kg. What we hypothesized was that, okay, you have a test that works very well at 8 ml per kg, but today we're using 6 ml per kg, so why don't we transiently increase the tidal volume from 6 ml per kg to 8 ml per kg, and then look at the uh, pulse pressure variation in these uh, patients. And what we were able to determine was that uh, it was not the value at 8 as we imagined, 
as you can see in the area under the curve, uh, the at 6 ml per kg is not very reliable. When we increase the tidal volume to 8 ml per kg for one minute, it was much more reliable. However, the delta, that is the difference between the tidal volume at 6 and 8 ml per kg, was a better predictor of fluid responsiveness uh, than the value at 8 ml per kg. And if you look at uh, this, this is uh, demonstrated in this uh, delta values were, uh, you know, at uh, um, uh, 6 ml per kg were not very good, but uh, at 8 ml they were better. But the delta, that is a difference both for PPV and SVV was much better. And the cutoff values what we got was about 3.5 and uh, 4.2. Now I'll show this to you uh, very nicely. If you can see the screen and you can see the cardiac out, uh, the monitor, hemodynamic monitor, and you can also see the uh, ventilator screen. I put them together to show you how simple it is to do this test. You All you need is an arterial line. You don't need any continuous cardiac output monitor. And you can see the pulse pressure variation. The value is 8. The patient is uh, has 40, uh, ideal body weight is 45 kilos, so he's ventilated using 270 uh, ml of tidal volume. Now, as you can see, where we're giving a tidal volume challenge, we're going to increase the tidal volume from 6 ml per kg, that's 270, and I'm going to increase the tidal volume just for one minute to 8 ml per kg, and then we're going to look at the pulse pressure variation. So you can see the tidal volume has been increased, and now it's increased to 360, and look at the value of the pulse pressure variation. Like I mentioned, all you need is an arterial line for doing this test. You can see when you increase the tidal volume, the pulse pressure variation has increased from 8, it has increased to 10, it's increased further to 13, and uh, you observe this for one minute. We don't want to keep the tidal volume at 8 ml for a longer time. So after one minute, and you can see the value has become 15, we reduce the tidal volume back from 8 ml per kg back to 6 ml per kg. So we only subject the patient to one minute of 8 ml per kg, and you can see the tidal volume is being brought back. And what is very interesting is when you bring the tidal volume back to 8 6 ml per kg, the pulse pressure variation also goes down. So how do you interpret it? You started with 8. It became 15 after performing the tidal volume challenge. The difference between the two is 7. And this is more than the cutoff value of 3.5. Uh, and this patient is fluid responsive with a good specificity and sensitivity. This, of course, was a proof of concept study that we performed in our unit when we developed this test. The, the beauty of this, that this is that it can be used in resource-limited settings where you don't have continuous cardiac output monitoring. Very simple to perform and no need to do uh, different, uh, you know, calculations. Of course, this had to be validated and subsequently there have been several studies that have been conducted and it works very well actually in the operating room because muscle relaxant is given. You need the patient to be reasonably well sedated and and, you know, adapted to the ventilator, and this was done from the group of Mauricio Cecconi, uh, where they did it in patients, neurosurgical patients. It's also been done in robotic-assisted laparoscopic surgeries in the operating room, and also in prone position earning, both in the operating room. These are just some studies which have shown tidal volume challenge reliably predicts fluid responsiveness in these patients. And this is another study from Egypt where they found similar cutoff values as we found of 3.5. And this is another very elegant study from the group of Professor Hamzavi. Uh, uh, from France, and uh, one of the issues with uh, the reliability of pulse pressure variation and stroke volume vari uh, pulse pressure variation is that you know in patients in the ICU, as I mentioned, are not paralyzed. They, you know they do have uh, some spontaneous breathing efforts. So she looked at the reliability of both pulse pressure variation, I mean of uh, tidal volume challenge and passive leg raising in patients who had some spontaneous breathing efforts. And I would say uh, both PLR, which would reduce the pulse pressure variation, of course, and uh, uh, tidal volume challenge improve the reliability. So you can see at 6 ml, it's not very reliable. But after performing a tidal volume challenge and a passive leg raising, uh, the area under the curve improved to 0.79. Not very great, but definitely better than the value at 6 ml per kg. So in mechanically ventilated patients who have some spontaneous breathing, you can use this test to reasonably reliably predict uh, fluid responsiveness and it's better than using 6 ml per kg. And more recently, it's also been, uh, you know, studied in patients who have reduced respiratory system compliance, which is also a limitation of using uh, the tidal volume challenge. Now, I was very happy to see this meta-analysis and it's just been published from the uh, Chinese group. Now, there have been several studies using the uh, tidal volume challenge and uh, they have found that the tidal volume can reliably improve the reliability of pulse pressure variation in patients with low tidal volume and 
also in patients who have uh, low compliance, but of course, uh, and even, you know, in different values of PEEP, but of course, you need to cautiously apply it in patients with prone position and patients with spontaneous breathing because we need more studies uh, to validate it. Echocardiographic variables are also other tests and it's become like the stethoscope in the ICU. You can use IVC variability, SVC variability, also aortic root velocity, and uh, of course, not so reliable in spontaneous breathing, but really, really simple to do and easy to do at the bedside. And now we have more and more uh, intensivists who are trained in POCUS, and uh, you look at the variations in the IVC, and depending upon what formula you are using, you have different uh, cutoff values. And this is uh, the multi-center study that came from France that was published in the Blue Journal. And, um, you know, it was one of the largest studies comparing all the tests that uh, use, um, you know, use uh, are used to um, echocardiographic variables. And uh, unfortunately, quite disappointing. If you see the area under the curve, uh, the values, the best one was for SVC variability, uh, delta SVV, that was about 0.79. So not that reliable. And if you look so closely at the data, uh, you will see that almost two third of these patients were actually ventilated using low tidal volume. So even low tidal volume is a limitation because even IVC variability depends on heart-lung interaction. So it has the same limitations as tests used using, uh, you know, uh, heart-lung interactions as the other tests. But one area where it can be used is when the patient has arrhythmias, where the other tests like PPV, SVV are not reliable, uh, the IVC variability can be reliable. But the beauty of this is that it does, even before you put in any lines, you can do a very quick assessment of the patient. And, uh, you know, there is a learning curve, but uh, more and more people are, of course, getting trained to use this. And uh, this is a meta-analysis that was recently published of the diagnostic ac accuracy of IVC variability, and you can see that the pool sensitivity and specificity are uh, not very great, but still uh, quite acceptable for uh, clinical practice. And we also have the end expiratory occlusion test that comes from the group of Professor Taboul and uh, Xavier Monet, where it's a very smart test in intubated ventilated patients, where you can give, uh, you know, an, a 15 second expiratory hold. And uh, when you give this hold, it, uh, you know, prevents the next insuff uh, insuff inspiration from occurring. And when you release this hold, there's an increase in the cardiac output and, uh, uh, you know, increase more than 5% uh, separates very well responders from non-responders uh, with a good specificity and sensitivity. And this, uh, they have, uh, you know, the group has also done a meta-analysis where they have a 5% cutoff uh, value uh, and with a good specificity and sensitivity. So if the cardiac output increases more than 5%, uh, this patient is a fluid responder. Now, I would argue that a 5% is a very small uh, kind of margin that you have, and it can almost be the uh, margin of error. So the group has done a very uh, smart test. They've combined the end expiratory test with an inspiratory hold. So when you give the end expiratory test, uh, what you will see is an increase in the cardiac output. And when you give an inspiratory hold, there's a drop in the cardiac output. And they've combined the uh, effect of both these, and they found a uh, you know, uh, value of about 13%. So this is definitely a uh, uh, you know, much higher value than 5%. A little cumbersome to do the test, but I'm sure when you have automation, you can easily do these tests. And the group has also looked at more other, uh, other ways, like use, uh, you know, as using surrogates for cardi continuous cardiac output monitoring, because the test is most reliable when you use continuous cardiac output monitoring. Now, as I mentioned, all these tests use heart-lung interactions, but there's one test that doesn't. So all these limitations that I mentioned can be overcome by using the passive leg raising uh, test, whether it's spontaneous breathing, whether it's low tidal volume, arrhythmias, etc. And uh, Professor Taboul uh, is here, and he's the master of this test. And he always says that you have to do it very accurately. You start from semi-recumbent position, move the bed and not the patient. And it does need continuous cardiac output monitoring. And they have done a meta-analysis, which has got a very good cutoff value of 10%. Uh, with a good specificity and a sensitivity. Now, the issue with this test is, one, it cannot be performed in patients with brain-injured patients or patients who are orthopedic patients who cannot be mobilized, and you, it works very well with continuous cardiac output monitoring. So the group has also looked at other ways on uh, using other indices that could be used as surrogates for cardiac output, uh, like using plethysmographic oxygen saturation. They've also tried to use capillary refill time more recently, but more and more tests are used required before this can be validated. So, uh, uh, you know, if you compare all the surrogates that they've used, it is the cardiac output and the VTI uh, that is most reliable. And the other things like, you know, using uh, entitled CO2, perfusion index, PPV, SV, capillary refill time, uh, still are not as reliable, but definitely promising and can be used as uh, surrogates. And I really like this meta-analysis that has been published from South American Group, which compares all the tests uh, predicting fluid responsiveness. And I was very happy to see uh, that among the tests, the tidal volume challenge, the stroke volume variation, uh, end expiratory occlusion tests were more 
reliable in patients who ventilated with low tidal volume. And of course, the other tests, if you look at any of the commonly used tests, uh, they are more than uh, 0.8. And people always talk about, you know, the limitations of these tests. Okay, they predict fluid responsiveness, but what about outcomes? Uh, you know, few studies have been done, no mortality benefit, but definitely a few things like, uh, you know, giving less fluid, less blood, blood breast cell transfusion, less ventilated days have been demonstrated by using this test. And if you look at, the, uh, you know, incorporating these tests, these uh, tests for fluid responsiveness into an early goal-directed kind of therapy kind of model, this systematic review says that, uh, you know, you can actually, the assessment of fluid responsiveness appears to be associated with reduced mortality in ICU left length of stay when you incorporate it in a goal-directed uh, uh, method. And this is just a, a slide uh, which I've borrowed from a friend which compares all these tests assessing fluid responsiveness and you can see uh, that most of the commonly used tests are quite reliable, well demonstrated, perhaps not the mini fluid challenge, quite reliable and uh, easy to perform. Uh, passive leg raising may be a little, uh, may be a little cumbersome, but the other tests are easy to perform. Applicability is good in most of the tests and it's most can be performed even without cardiac output monitoring. Tests like index pretty occlusion test and uh, passive leg raising are looking at various ways uh, for surrogate mark uh, ways of looking at uh, cardiac output. So my take home message would be that the commonly used tests for assessing fluid responsiveness uh, that, that I've alluded to have certain limitations. The passive leg raising can uh, overcome most of the tests that can uh, that have the limitations of heart-lung interactions. Tidal volume challenge can be used in patients with low tidal volume and low com uh, compliance. And incorporating these tests in the dynamic in fluid responsiveness in early goal-directed uh, therapy has shown to reduce mortality and days uh, of ICU stay. And what's most important is no tool is perfect, and you need to integrate the various dynamic indices with your clinical assessment uh, in in your clinical management. I thank you very much for your attention with this. I will just end with what this very wise man said, that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that counted uh, can be counted. There's a lot of things that are still unknown until we find the perfect test to assess fluid responsiveness. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Uh, questions? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for a very nice presentation, uh, a very fast presentation as well. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I have, I'm not sure I quite got it. I understand that the pulse pressure variation is related to the heart and lung interaction. So when you increase the tidal volume from 6 ml to 8 ml, for example, in a 100 kilo patient with RDS, that'll be 200 uh, milliliters increase in tidal volume. Right. So that would increase the afterload on the right ventricle as well. So how can you differentiate your um, yeah. pressure variation between a failing preload hypovolemia or an increased afterload, failing yeah. right ventricle? So again, this is... This is not like, it's a dynamic test of a dynamic test, you're right. It's pulse pressure variation itself is a dynamic test where you're looking at these variations. And, um, you know, a lot of situations where the pulse pressure variation was actually limited, like uh, patients with low compliance, uh, patients with, uh, you know, um, low tidal volume, other situations where pulse pressure variation didn't work and we thought the tidal volume challenge would not work. Interestingly, the, the tidal volume challenge was reliable in this kind of setting. So perhaps I can't explain the exact mechanism to you how it should work, but in these experiment, in these studies that have been done, they have uh, shown to increase uh, the reliability of uh, assessing. And most of these tests are done with looking at, uh, you know, giving fluid to the patient and an increase in cardiac output uh, of 10%. So they have been tested against the gold standard uh, to look at the reliability of the tests and have shown to be reliable. Thank you. Yes, maybe uh, the question of, of just uh, ask, maybe uh, in these studies you talk about not only our study, but all the studies did not include patients with RV dysfunction. So yeah, maybe yeah. in patients with RV dysfunction, you could be right. Maybe, I'm not sure. But if you increase tidal volume, you could impede afterload of the right range call. But in other people, in other patients, probably not. Yeah. And this to this, uh, Absolutely concern, right, yeah. and our right ventricular dysfunction is usually looked at as a limitation even for pulse pressure variation and uh, stroke volume variation. Yeah. My question was, the surviving sepsis guidelines, they mentioned that the passive flag raising test, you might uh, miss some patients uh, in terms of fluid responsiveness, and they recommend the four mils per kilo 
for, for the flute challenge. So what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so um, and this 4ML package comes from the study from the group of uh, Maurizio Cecconi, which have shown, you know, they've uh, determined a minimum volume that you require to do an ideal fluid challenge and also the duration that is required. So it's at least 4ML package and because there's wide variation in the way people give a fluid challenge and also a minimum, uh, you know, uh, should not be extended over a long time, like 30 minutes or a longer time, uh, because then there is some adaptation and the results may not be reliable. So uh, interpret it over 10 minutes. So that is the reason and they mentioned this uh, 4 ml per kg. Uh, if you ask me about passive leg raising, I think it's been, extend uh, Professor Taboul is the expert here, it's been extensively studied and a 10% cutoff and it's a good good value and if you uh, you know have an increase in cardiac output of 10% and you're also generating a good volume of fluid about 300 to 350 ml uh, correct me if i'm wrong so it's actually a very good auto challenge compared to the index pretty occlusion test where you may not be able to mobilize as much fluid as you can with the passive leg raising last question and after we have to move to the other presentation the catch in, in, in this time of thinking is this. Uh, you support passive leg raising as something that's working, but the prerequisite is that you have to measure cardiac output. So you try to use something easy and you, have, you combine it with something that's rather advanced. Patient has, uh, has either an anterior line or a central venous catheter or a pulmonary catheter or something to measure cardiac output. So if Cardiac output is not available. Is there something else that you could use as a response to a passive leg raising test? Right. So, if cardiac output, you can just cardiac output monitor is not used. You can use you can use cardiac uh, you can use passive leg raising with the VGI. You could use it with uh, echocardiography. But again, it's not one test. Like you said, there's no test that's perfect. You could use a tidal volume challenge. You don't need any cardiac output monitoring. You just need an arterial line. So, it's not one test. It's a combination of tests that's going to be uh, working. And what's important is that we should move away from the static tests to the more dynamic tests rather than rely on uh, just CVP to assess fluid responsiveness, as is commonly done in clinical practice. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so we move from one giant in critical care to another giant in critical care. It's my uh, honor to welcome Professor Bakker, who will now hopefully convince us just to look at the peripheral microcirculation. Oh. I was going to say where Professor Bakker is from, but it's too, too, too many places. Takes too long. Holland, the Netherlands, South America, Japan, New York, they're where all, else? Except Japan, they're all correct, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, the answer is of course no. If you listen to what, what Sheila just told us, uh, there is never one test that will help you to solve the problem. That's definitely true for peripheral circulation. And, and for the presentation, I will use different parameters of peripheral circulation, near infrared, uh, peripheral perfusion index, capillary refill time. At the end of the day, they're more or less the same. Uh, otherwise, it took, will take forever to, uh, let's say, get through the presentation. I have noticed, oh, I go the wrong way. Yeah, I have no disclosures for this um, for this presentation. And we need to create a context because once you start using a parameter, you need to understand where this parameter or this thinking comes from. The context of this, uh, you only have to use peripheral perfusion is a few. And one is hypovolemia results in activation of your sympathetic nervous system. And if you have this activation, then you have decreased abnormal peripheral perfusion. Uh, because of the vasoconstriction. And remember, even in septic shock, many think that septic shock is a vasodilatory hyperdynamic state. It's not true. In 70% of your patients, you have vasoconstriction in septic shock throughout your initial resuscitation. So forget it. Uh, septic shock is not a vasodilatory state to begin with. We make it into a vasodilatory state, but that's not how it starts. That's what we learned from uh, the Andromeda 1 study. A failure to vasoconstrict, and that's more like if you want to get fluids out, a failure to vasoconstrict, so if you're already very vasoconstricted, <clears throat> probably worsens circulatory failure, uh, 
if you induce or have hypovolemia. And the other element of the context is that if you improve tissue perfusion, so tissue flow, that's uh, associated with a decreased vasoconstriction and so an improvement of the parameters of peripheral perfusion. Um, and so we think that these parameters, whatever you use, uh, will reflect these three uh, processes. Let me give you a demonstration of part of this uh, uh, context that I created. Uh, this is a study that we did in healthy volunteers. We subjected them to um, a lower body negative pressure and significant lower body negative pressure, minus 60. That's a, a huge decrease in venous return because that's a basic mechanism of lower body negative pressure. And we measured the parameter of peripheral perfusion uh, in combination with stroke volume. <clears throat> um, and as you can see, stroke volume is, oh, uh, sorry. Um, stroke volume is here, and the peripheral perfusion index, uh, the heart rate is here, um, and the peripheral perfusion index is the red one. And so if you induce uh, um, a restriction in venous return, of course your stroke volume will fall, and you start to vasoconstrict. And that's how they maintain, main, uh, basically maintain part of their uh, um, mean arterial pressure. And when you stop the uh, negative pressure, and so you have this burst of venous return, cardiac output returns to normal, you get this return of this peripheral perfusion index to completely normal. As I said, one of the elements is also if you're already in a state of vasoconstriction and you cannot compensate, that makes things worse. Um, we experienced that during one of the sessions because one of the healthy volunteers, they're all soccer players, um, so no cardiac problems, uh, collapsed. Um, and we didn't appreciate the start of the study because at the start of the study, he was already significantly vasoconstricted. Remember, the healthy volunteers were here, the other ones. And so he already started in a severely vasoconstricted state, probably because he was somewhat anxious and, and, and of course you're half with your body in a, in a chamber. Um, and so what happened if when we started to uh, uh, decrease his cardiac output, there was no way the, 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 the healthy volunteer could compensate. And so he had a circulatory collapse. He lost consciousness. We immediately stopped the negative pressure and everything returned to normal. And of course, he was uh, otherwise okay. But it's just to demonstrate, and it will come back at the end in renal replacement therapy, that if, if you cannot vasoconstrict because you're already vasoconstricted, you're in even more trouble. So if you're vasoconstricted in septic stock and you start bleeding, you're in deep trouble. If you have hypovolemia and you have vasoconstriction and you treat the hypovolemia, then the vasoconstriction disappears. This is a very early study from uh, Greg Bielman from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, Greg is a, colon uh, a colonel, I think, in the army. Um, and uh, during his time in, in war uh, areas, uh, he did uh, a study using near infrared, basically also peripheral circulation, um, looking at battlefield injuries. And, and of course, these battlefield injuries are by definition almost hypovolemia. These young people are uh, bleeding. Um, and at this point, at the start of the resuscitation, their near infrared was 55, normal is more than 70. Um, and then they gave fluids and uh, uh, red blood cells. And you see in almost in, in every uh, uh, injured soldier, the uh, near infrared, so the parameter of peripheral perfusion improved. Of course, you have to stop the bleeding as well. I mean, it doesn't make sense to give blood and let the patient bleed. So stop the bleeding, uh, 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 give the fluids, restore cardiac output, and they will restore peripheral perfusion. Does this uh, affect outcome? I mean, a, a lot of discussion was in the previous uh, talks about outcome. Um, does restoration of peripheral perfusion have an impact of the chances of your patient to survive? Uh, that's a, a question we asked ourselves when we did a study in Santiago, in Chile, uh, 
And we took the fir very first fluid resuscitation in patients that met criteria for sepsis and um, severe sepsis at that time. <clears throat> and so they required fluids because the attending uh, saw a clinical indication for fluid. We didn't interfere with the reason why they gave fluids. Um, and we, oh, very difficult. Um, so we studied before and after, and on average they gave about 1.5 liters to these patients. Um, and as you can see, there was a, a, a not hypotension in every patient. And remember, in Santiago we do a lot of peripheral perfusion studies. So as you can see in some, uh, the indication was uh, lactate or poor uh, capillary refill time with an intact um, uh, blood pressure. Now what was the uh, benefit of the patient or what was the hemodynamic profile, that's maybe even better, of patient that responded with an improvement in peripheral perfusion if you gave fluids, a huge difference in mortality. Not a little bit, but a huge difference in mortality. So if you did not respond in your periphery when you gave fluids, the mortality was more than 50%, uh, 56% almost. If you responded to this fluid resuscitation of, on average, 1.5 liters, the mortality was less than 10%, almost 10%. That's a huge difference in mortality. And th so this is phenotype. This is not because of the fluid they survived, but it's the state the, these patients were in and the state where the increase in cardiac output was able to restore peripheral perfusion that made them survive their critical illness. And so, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference if you're a responder to fluids, and especially if you only measure capillary refill time, which is available in any context, of course. Now, the next uh, uh, thing we did, okay, you have given your fluids, and you think, okay, this is probably enough, uh, but there is a persistence of symptoms that could be related to hypoperfusion. So we studied with Eva Klein, um, the effect of uh, an additional fluid resuscitation after the first uh, initial fluid resuscitation when there were still signs of abnormal peripheral perfusion. Can an additional fluid bolus improve peripheral perfusion? That was basically the question. We started uh, 35 patients, um, all had their initial resuscitation, and what we did is a simple intervention, 250 ml of colloids in 15 minutes, when they had these parameters, I will show the parameters in the next slide. There were 19 responders and 16 non-responders. Uh, all the responders were on a mechanical ventilator, um, which was a little bit different for the non-responders because it was 81%. Uh, and the question was, as I said, do parameters of peripheral perfusion predict fluid responsiveness? And uh, this, is, oh, this is the parameter. This is the parameters that we used. So persisting hypotension, uh, increased heart rate, low SCVO2, which is a marker of low cardiac output, of course, uh, increasing vasopressor requirements despite fluids, uh, decreasing urine output or a mottled skin. And we compared this ultimately with the passive leg raising, which I won't go into. So the question is, what happened with this 250 ml? Did patients increase their peripheral circulation so could the peripheral circulation pre predict um, the fluid responsiveness? Yes. Uh, in the responders, there was an improvement in peripheral circulation, whereas in the non-responders, there was no improvement in peripheral circulation. So you could argue, if you do a test, you give 250 ml, you have an indicator of peripheral perfusion, and it improves after the 250 L, uh, ml, that would be uh, a count as a meaningful intervention. Uh, Ricardo Castro in, in Santiago did a study based on the Andromeda 1, where he looked at patients randomized to uh, capillary refill time um, uh, guided circulation, uh, circulation management or lactate circulation management. That's basically Andromeda 1. And this was a sub-study in Andromeda 1. Um, and he looked at the uh, evolution of capillary refill time and other parameters of peripheral perfusion like STO2, so near infrared, uh, and microcirculation, MFI, that is microcirculation under the tongue, um, 
and also markers of liver perfusion and the delta pco 2 was a marker of cardiac output. It was a small study, uh, but was interesting, the dynamics of the capillary refill time were much faster than lactate. So lactate improved over time, so fulfilling the lactate criteria, 20% uh, decrease or become normal, um, took time. Uh, and even at 24 hours, um, not all patients uh, met this goal, whereas you can see that the, uh, the uh, response time of capillary refill time was much faster. And so in addition to uh, the simplicity, it also is a much faster parameter than, for instance, lactate. And finally, uh, with Michel van Genderen, we show that if you have normal peripheral perfusion in septic shock, you don't have to give fluids. Um, so this is a, a fluid restriction uh, uh, study. If you had normal peripheral perfusion, you were not allowed to get fluids if you had a clinical problem. If you wanted to solve the problem, you could use dobutamine, you could use norepinephrine, whatever you want, but not fluids. Um, and so what he showed is if you have normal peripheral perfusion and you don't give fluids, then you improve organ dysfunction or organ uh, function. Uh, the mean uh, difference in SOFA uh, was significantly uh, different between the two groups. <clears throat> and so underscoring the fact that if you have normal peripheral perfusion, you could maybe reach earlier to Nathan Shapiro bag of norepinephrine instead of uh, to fluids. And uh, uh, as a subgroup analysis from Andromeda 2, we show that if you use lactate to continue peripheral perfusion, to continue uh, resuscitation in a patient with normal peripheral perfusion, you increase mortality. This is uh, what the study shows. So if you are in the lactate group and your lactate doesn't decrease, you continue resuscitation. And we looked at patients with abnormal capillary refill time in both groups. So here you would continue resuscitation and here you would continue resuscitation. And the mortality is not different. However, if you continue to resuscitate on lactate levels in patients with normal capillary refill time, the mortality is around 40%. If you stop resuscitating in normal capillary refill time, the mortality is about half. And so continued resuscitation in patients with normal capillary refill time doesn't make much sense. That's, let's say, the message of, these, uh, of this study. And that's why we came up with this uh, flow diagram where <coughs> fluid responsiveness is uh, an important element um, next to markers or other markers of uh, tissue perfusion. I will skip this one. So finally, um, only a small part, if you want to take volume out of the patient. There are many clinical studies show that you can take volume out and that patient will benefit um, and that patients do well if you use CVVH or fruzamide to get to a negative fluid balance. Um, there is not a, a lot of guidance, um, but peripheral perfusion can help you. We did a study with Eva Klein in uh, 23 patients uh, during CVVH, and this was protocolized, uh, let's say, negative fluid balance during CVVH. Uh, baseline characteristics within uh, both groups were not uh, very different, except for maybe vasopressor support. It was not significant, but remember, it's a small group. Um, and the, uh, the, the overall fluid balance was a little bit uh, different. Uh, seven liters is, of course, uh, a lot, but that relates to the peripheral perfusion. Pay attention. So what we found is basically the same as what happened to the healthy volunteer. If you are vasoconstricted at baseline and you start CVVH and want to get, a, let's say, two liters out, forget it. You get hypotension. Whether you can use a vasopressor in that uh, area is something that we didn't address in this study. That's what we do in clinical practice. We add the vasopressor and continue uh, uh, getting a negative fluid balance. But um, if you want to predict that you will get a problem, um, if you have a low perfusion pressure or a increased a low capillary refill time, um, expect hypotension to happen. Um, 
I do this in critically ill patients. Um, if I have one volume out and they have low capillary refill time, I give midrodin uh, orally if it's a regular patient, and they do well you, uh, usually during the uh, CVVH. Um, as you can see, if you take volume out, the capillary refill time decreases uh, also in the other ones. That's the compensation. Uh, that's the normal physiology. Uh, and so that's the only study there is in, in the literature, to be honest, um, when you want to take volume out and you want to use peripheral perfusion. So, in conclusion, induced hypovolemia is associated with abnormal parameters of uh, peripheral perfusion. Initial resuscitation with fluids may improve these parameters. If so, this is associated with a better outcome. Stopping fluid resuscitation when peripheral perfusion has normalized may be adequate. And continued resuscitation in patients with normal peripheral perfusion chasing a lactate level is probably not a very wise outcome parameter. De-resuscitation, so removing fluids, can be done on clinical parameters, but if you're already vasoconstricted at baseline, be aware of um, oncoming hypotension. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are running a little bit behind, and I'm conscious that the poster session will start at 6 o'clock. Uh, is there a burning question for Professor Bakker? If not, then thank you for your contribution, and we move on in the program. <clears throat> yes, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jacques Duranto from Bicet Hospital in France. And he will talk about um, look only at the microcirculation. I think that it is very, very short. Very short. Yes, just only at the microcirculation. Just the microcirculation. And just to open your mind and just to uh, show you that we have plenty work to do, not only look at the arterial pressure of our patient. So uh, why uh, should we look at the microcirculation? Uh, it's important because uh, we try uh, every day trying to optimize our patient based on the macro circulation uh, and we try to increase the arterial pressure, we try to look at uh, the stroke volume because I think it's very important not only to look at the arterial pressure but also to have in part something about uh, fluid, about flow. And uh, the goal, we hope that when we optimize macrocirculation, we will optimize microcirculation. We hope so. Uh, but in the absence of uh, monitoring of microcirculation, for me, it's really a black box. And uh, we hope to uh, improve microcirculation, but we have no idea of this. And uh, we have no idea because initially, if we talk about the coherence between macro and micro circulation, there is a coherence between both. It's the same physiologic system. And uh, when we have to face to hypovolemia, hypotension, cardiac dysfunction, or hypoxemia and venous congestion, there is a link between macro and micro. And if we consider hypovolemia, for example, we can have a decrease in stroke volume, a decrease in the flow at the level of microcirculation. And if we give fluid, for example, we restore microcirculation. But after the story maybe is more complicated. Because if we have sepsis, if we have inflammation, for example, in our ICU patient or in the operating room after several hours of surgical procedure, it could be more complicated because we can have specific alteration of microcirculation, for example, endothelial dysfunction, glycocalyx alteration, or we can have change in the balance pro and anticoagulation. Uh, we can have uh, edema or we can have uh, red blood cell alteration. 
for example, with transfusion. So the risk is to move from a state where we have coherence between macro and micro to a state where there is incoherence between the macro and the micro circulation. And at this time, maybe by improving macro circulation, we fail to improve micro circulation. So why should we look at microcirculation to treat microcirculation alteration as soon as possible and to avoid their persistence and to have uh, an even more uh, personalized approach to hemodynamic optimization. We are happy when we have a good arterial pressure, good stroke volume, but what about microcirculation? So Daniel De Baker shows this, uh, I like this study because it's a sublingual study in septic shock. So for some time people think about sublingual micro, uh, uh, microcirculation, is it really a, uh, a pertinent uh, parameters? It is, because it's in this patient when you fail to restore microcirculation, it's the only parameters which were able to predict mortality better than lactate, better than the SVO2 or the mean arterial pressure. So there is something under the tongue. And we found the same thing in uh, hemorrhagic shock. It's a trauma patient where we were very, after stopping the bleeding, we were very happy because we restore microcirculation. But looking at the sublingual microcirculation, wow, it no, was not very, very good. And we have still alteration during until uh, at day one, day two, and day three. Sam Hutchison uh, performed the same study and he found only an alteration at day one. And what was very interesting between the two studies is that we use more vasopressor than him. And maybe it's the reason. So just uh, these studies that we perform in septic patients, because for me, it's really the proof that we have alteration of microcirculation and we are completely blind. It's septic shock. We uh, perform recitation based on macrocirculation. Uh, macro and we were, all the patients were okay. They were all, uh, it's, uh, they have all norepinephrine, but we have good microcirculation. But at the level of the kidney microcirculation that we look at, uh, we have the uh, echo, uh, we have uh, uh, the ultrasound echo. Uh, you can see that in some patients, it's three of uh, the patients that we studied, there is normal microcirculation at the level of the kidney. And uh, in some patients, there is nothing, no perfusion, nothing. And in some patients, there is an increase of the flow. <laughs> so, in some patients, you, you can stop to give fluid. The microcirculation is okay. But in other patients, you have really a problem, despite the fact that you normalize the microcirculation. And when you look at it's a small number of patients, there is a great heterogeneity. But despite the fact that it's a small number of patients with a great heterogeneity. When you look at the perfusion index at the level of the kidney, it was altered in septic shock in comparison to a control group. And when you look at patients who develop acute kidney injury, clearly it was patients who had an alteration of microcirculation at the level of the kidney. So for me, it's really a powerful proof of the job that <laughs> we have to do to be to find a device to monitor the microcirculation. So uh, we uh, uh, in this study, 
uh, we look at the microcirculation in the operating room during surgery and uh, you can see that uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, microcirculation when uh, we have uh, to uh, an increase uh, in the uh, pulse pressure and when we perform a free challenge you can see that uh, we check uh, each period of increase of delta pp and uh, uh, we perform a free challenge you can see that uh, uh, we uh, increase uh, the stroke volume but we have still an alteration of minatal pressure after the free challenge it's under anesthesia at the level of microcirculation, clearly when we have an increase in the delta PP, we have an alteration, immediate alteration of the sublingual microcirculation. So for me, it's a sign that initially with coherence between macro and microcirculation, sublingual microcirculation, clearly it's uh, an index of hypovolemia. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, we restore uh, the sublingual microcirculation after free challenge. What was interesting in this study is that uh, uh, when you look at uh, uh, in this patient, seven of these patients had, when they uh, had an increase in the delta PP, they had normal sublingual microcirculation. So maybe in this patient, it was not very smart to give fluid because the, sub the sublingual microcirculation was okay. So maybe uh, the classical uh, preload uh, dependency uh, could, at the level of microcirculation, could be, has to be more investigated. And when we give fluid and we observe no improvement of arterial pressure, if you look at just arterial pressure during anesthesia, so I have a decrease in arterial pressure. I am not capable to restore arterial pressure. Most of the anesthesiologists, they give more fluid. <laughs> okay? But at this time, the micro sublingual microcirculation, it's okay. You have not to give fluid. You have to give vasopressor. It's just, it's just vasodilation. It's not hypovolemia. So, and uh, this, uh, this study that uh, uh, Flick uh, performed, I like this study because it's uh, during uh, surgery and it's uh, during uh, prostatectomy. And until uh, they remove the prostate, they had a strategy where they tried to decrease the fluid to prevent uh, hemodilution and to increase the norepinephrine. And you know, it's uh, right now, it's uh, uh, what uh, we do more and more. We restrict fluid and we increase norepinephrine. And uh, you can see that uh, when you look at uh, the uh, sublingual microcirculation, if you take the flow, for example, the MFI, you can see that uh, you have a decrease of the MFI, it's 2.76, so it's, uh, we consider that uh, uh, below 2.6, it's a decrease in the microvascular flow at the sublingual level, and when you give fluid after, you restore. But for me, it's the sublingual microcirculation, or looking at the microcirculation, it's really the good way to see if your balance between fluid and vasopressor is okay. Because it's, uh, uh, the surgeons are very efficient and the surgery is very short. If you increase the surgery, the time of surgery, maybe it's not 2.5 that you will have, maybe it's 2.0 or less by this strategy. So I think it's a good way to alarm us about uh, uh, the balance between fluid and vasopressor. So uh, in conclusion, I think it's very important to integrate uh, microcirculation analysis in uh, uh, our uh, way to guide uh, hemodynamic resuscitation to prevent and treat organ dysfunction. The challenge is uh, to find a non-invasive, easy to use uh, uh, microcirculation analysis technique with a real-time analysis. And uh, I think that monitoring microcirculation can contribute to the individualization of hemodynamic uh, resuscitation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your enthusiastic presentation. <laughs>
But I'm I afraid try that, to stay in yeah, time. Yeah, I'm afraid that we have no time for questions because we should finish at six. We have a poster session at six, and now it's time to 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 move to the presentation, Marius. And we have the fi the final talk by Professor De Backer. Again, he's very well known to you, an expert in fluid management, and he's going to remind us to look at the patient and put it all together. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for staying here. Um, and so, yes, we know that uh, fluid balance is uh, something that is associated with the worst outcome. And this is one trial showing this, another trial showing this exactly the same aspect. More severe positive fluid balance, more severe outcome. Uh, another one exactly showing exactly the same, more patients, exactly the same results. And um, it can be even this kind of a trial looking at um, the cumulative fluid balance, the larger it is, the larger the detrimental effects on several aspects, not only mortality, but also ventilatory uh, associated events um, in these kind of patients. And the same is true for the kidney uh, with a, a more positive fluid balance and more um, uh, effects on the, on the kidney. So we can say that indeed we should try to prevent having a positive fluid balance because it's really something very detrimental. But at some point, is it really the fluid balance or the fluid balance is just an, a mention that this patient is more severe than another? We may, of course, ask ourselves this at some point. And especially, we may say, ah, no, 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 no. We adjusted for everything. We do a lot of adjustments, and so we use Cox, multivariate, whatever, propensity scores, and we were able to compensate for all these factors. Yes, but often you use a dichotomic aspect, ventilated, not ventilated. Renal replacement therapy, yes or no. But the severity of the acute coronary injury, the severity of respiratory dysfunction is not taken into account. And one good example is just this one. You can see that indeed they did a lot of adjustment here. Maybe the software score was a little bit taking some aspects there, but otherwise for the uh, hypoxemia, well, nothing that just ventilated yes or no. And for the vasopressors, you can see that indeed uh, the number of patients with vasopressor increased, but also the doses increased, and the same was true for the butamine. And so this may not be captured. And perhaps even more importantly, often we just discuss a fluid balance and we infer that you as a doctor were not good, you were giving too much volume. But maybe it was a patient not passing urine. Uh-huh, okay. So let's look at these data. Look at the red one, the non-survivors, and the green one, the survivors. And indeed, there was a huge difference in the fluid balance that was more positive here for the non-survivors and remained higher than in survivors who were even able to achieve a negative fluid balance at some point. But what were the doctors doing? Well, the doctors were at some point doing indeed some aspect here because you can see that the difference in intake was okay, 300 milliliters to begin with on day one, just after 24 hours. And you can see later on, okay, the same difference here. So really not accounting for the difference in fluid balance that we saw before. And because they also looked at, 20, at 76 hours or three days, you can see that yeah, no major difference again at that point. If we look at the urine output difference, yes, this was much more pronounced. You can see uh, already here at baseline, there was a huge difference here between the two groups. And this persisted over time. And so obviously, the difference in output here was contributing more to the difference in fluid balance than the amount of fluids that the doctors were actually giving to the patients. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because indeed, we do not have a lot of things to do to prevent that. Just making our patient more happy 
but this is that perhaps what you already tried. And so we can see that indeed in that trial, the difference in fluid balance was exactly the difference in urine output that was accounted there. Well, I say, okay, that's just one trial. No, it's not just one trial. This trial also looking at the impact on, on the kidney, you can see also that most of the difference was the difference in output, not the difference in intake in these patients. And by the way, when you look at the data here, you can see that indeed, when you look at the cumulative fluid balance, there was increasing mortality. But if you just look at the difference in urine output, you have exactly this. And then at that time, the difference in fluid balance disappears. So obviously, this seems to be one of the most important aspects. And here again, you can see that among these patients here, uh, who are oliguric, you can see that indeed the uh, daily fluid balance is uh, quite different here, but uh, this is not really the factors leading to the mortality. It's mostly the fact that these patients were oliguric. The difference in fluid balance was really minimal, only a couple of milliliters uh, in, in between the different groups. So obviously, uh, we need to pay attention to the fact that Yes, we have a difference in daily fluid balance, but sometimes it's just indeed at the end, the urine output that can make the difference there. So another question we need to ask ourselves, when we face the difference in fluid balance and accumulation of fluids, is this accumulation of fluid leading to the detrimental effects directly by edema or whatever, or is it just some other factors, like maybe the increase in the venous pressure, venous stasis, or whatever? And then indeed, again, if we look at these data, it's quite interesting to realize that it is only when it reaches um, uh, some value quite elevated here that we have indeed an increase in mortality. And indeed, we can ask ourselves, is it the CVP increase or is it the positive fluid balance itself that was responsible for the increase in mortality? And it's quite important because other trials have shown indeed some direct link between the increase in the venous pressure and the increase in mortality. And also, this is quite important because it also, we have to take this into account when we look at the perfusion pressure of the kidney, as an example here from our, one of our chair women that indeed published this very interesting paper where indeed the Perfusion pressure was here very important here, and perhaps as much as just the main arterial pressure that was present in these patients. So we need to pay attention to the pressure, perhaps also pay attention to the flow, because indeed having some venous abnormality of the venous flow can also lead to some problem. So the question will be how to optimize the fluid administration because we want to look at the patient and not the fluid balance. So we consider that in some conditions we will give volumes, some kind, sometimes not. And so should we indeed go back to being more liberal, more restrictive? We touched a little bit on this, this uh, at the entrance of this session, but remember that we have indeed several trials like this one, not showing anything here in terms of mortality, but remember that the free responsiveness was not assessed in these patients. And by the way, there were also some other signals that were quite interesting. And especially when the patient were kept dry initially, it was probably better to be more liberal after. On the, on the contrary, when the patient received initially a lot of fluids, then it was better to keep these patients dry thereafter. So again, individualizing the therapy may perhaps be better than just a formula. And we already mentioned this trial um, of Nathan Shapiro uh, to begin with this session. And again, this difference here in, in volume, we may discuss the difference in protocol after, but nevertheless, a two liters difference here that was not leading to any difference in mortality. Um, maybe more vasopressors here, but again, no difference in mortality and no difference in other organ support there. Be careful. Um, we need to look at more detail in that trial. And one of the factors is that the most severe patients were excluded. Why do you say this? Well, here, 1,700 patients were excluded because they received already three liters 
before randomization. And so they only randomized 1,500, but more patients were excluded because they already received some fleas. And we thought, okay, but this was for severe hypovolemia. No, no, severe hypovolemia was here, 300. So these were septic patients receiving more than three liters before. Uh-huh. And something also very important, the other one, well, 35% of the patient did not reach the ICU. One third of the patient did not go to the ICU in both groups. This means that this is not an ICU trial. This is an emergency department trial. And many patients were totally well because they were not sent to the ICU after a couple of hours. So if we want to discuss how to manage the patient in the ICU, being dry, being wet, well, this is not a trial that would help us because most of the patients, uh, two thirds of the patients were going to the ICU, but one third was not going to the ICU there. So about the optimized fluid management, we need to individualize the recitation fluids and we should also minimize the non-recitation fluids because this is of course something very important here. For the dilution fluids, we still need to be more cautious because of course we also want the drug to enter the patient. And if we have some uh, free space there, it's good to rinse this amount there, otherwise some part of the antibiotic will not reach the patient and we will have this, uh, this problem also at some point. So we need to decrease the maintenance rate, but we need to be much more cautious about the dilution rates just to be sure that the patients are treated correctly for all the other factors. But we need again to be adapting ourselves to the situation. This is just one observational trial, okay, but look at these patients. The patient treated with minimal doses of vasopressors well, it doesn't matter if you give a um, minimal amount of fluid, even no fluid at all, this patient will have a good survival. Well, the patient with a very high dose of norepinephrine, this patient, please do not keep this patient too dry, otherwise mortality will peak up to very high levels. This is why indeed we need to adapt ourselves to the condition of the patient, and we need indeed to individualize the therapy. And how to do this? probably by early introduction of vasopressors that can indeed limit the amount of fluids in some conditions and perhaps let to improve outcome in some of these patients. Fluid management, again, need to individualize. We need to think at it. And so we need to have a problem to give volume. And I, I love the talk of uh, Jan Backer just before, because indeed, it's exactly in line with what I would like to say. We need to have a problem, and the problem needs to be a problem with tissue perfusion. It can be capillary field time, of course, can be some other signs, of course, sometimes, but we need to have a problem that need to be perhaps benefiting from fluids. Then we need to look at these data already presented, that indeed, when the patient already normalized tissue perfusion, giving more volume will just result in an increase in mortality in these conditions. And of course, then we need to assess the fluid responsiveness, just as presented by Sheila and Miatra um, with various tests. We accept that we have errors in these tests. We do not predict 100%, but then we can combine the test. And of course, we need to know the limitation of each of these tests. And then we do the administration of fluids. And when we do this administration of fluid, we need to evaluate the response of fluid. Why? Because prediction of fluids is not the tolerance to fluid. And so indeed, we need to evaluate the efficacy, but also we need to evaluate whether our patient is tolerating the fluids with lung edema, okay, B lines if you wish, or exovascular water. You can also look at the uh, venous stasis and also please pay attention to the right medical function to your patient because this can also deteriorate. And of course, when the patient is responding, that's fine, you can continue. And especially when the patient is responding and tolerating the fluids very well. When the patient is not responding, please stop to give volume. This is not the way to go. When the patient responded, but Okay, minimal changes, perhaps you can continue, but you need to be much more cautious because mm, maybe the next time you may not tolerate. But when the patient had here the, uh, sorry, at here the, uh, the response to fluid in terms of cardiac output, but signs of poor tolerance, 
then this is much more critical because the price to pay begins to be quite important and maybe some alternatives can be discussed at that time. And for this, of course, discuss vasopressors, discuss hydropic agents. We need to go in that direction. And at some point, do not forget to also de-escalate in your therapy. Withdraw the fruit you have given in excess, withdraw the vasopressors, and always pay attention to tissue perfusion because we do not want to de-resuscitate our patients. And so to conclude, the debate between liberal and restrictive is really outdated. And so just discussing the fluid balance in itself has no sense. We need to look at our patients and indeed we should optimize the administration of fluids based on the cautious evaluation of the requirements based on perfusion indices, on the fluid responsiveness and of course on the tolerance of the fluids and the benefit risk ratio should be evaluated for each individual patient. And with this, I thank you for your attention.